All right, so good afternoon. I would like to call to order the meeting on Senate Revenue and Economic Development. Will the secretary please call the roll? Senator Dennis. Here. Senator Raddy. Senator Kiekefer. Here. Senator Severs Gansert. Here. Chair Neal. Here. Madam Secretary, can you please mark uh, Senator Raddy present as she arrives? Okay, so before we begin, I would like to explain um, how virtual committee meetings will work. Since this is a new process, we will continue to repeat this until everyone becomes comfortable with the virtual reality. As you know, the legislative building is currently closed to the public, and so all committee meetings will be held virtually, meaning committee members, staff, and everyone else will participate either through Zoom, video conference, or by telephone. However, there are various ways members of the public can engage with us and participate throughout the process. As in previous sessions, all committee-related information is available on Nellis, which is accessible on the legislative website. There are four ways to engage with the committee. These include registering to participate in a committee meeting through the new system on Nellis, which places you in line to testify on the bill, providing public comment during the meeting. Submitting, submitting written testimony to the committee is sent by sending to the committee email address or fax number listed on the agenda. Sharing your opinion via the legislator's opinion application on Nellis or viewing committee meetings through Nellis or on the legislator's YouTube channel. During the 2021 legislative session to testify on a bill or provide public comment, Members of the public must first register for the meeting you would like to participate in. Committee meetings are listed in several places on Nellis and simply click participation and then you will then be moved into a queue. You will then tell um, what that you, once your registration is submitted, you will get a confirmation screen and you will also receive an email with a phone number and meeting ID to call at the time of the meeting. Just note that while meeting registration is required to participate, it is not guarantee, guarantee you will be able to speak. If you are signing in in opposition or neutral or support, please click the registration button. If you need assistance with any of these processes, or if you would like to receive electronic notification of the committee's agenda and minutes, please contact our committee manager at the committee email listed on the agenda. And if you need help with instructions on participating, go to the help page, which is linked in the banner at the top of every page on Nellis. So to start off this meeting today, we'll be starting off with a work session and our work session will be on SB 24. Uh, Mr. Real. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Joe Real, Deputy Fiscal Analyst with the Fiscal Analysis Division. Committee, you have um, the work session document is available on Nellis and says Senate Bill 24 revises provisions relating to workforce development. It's sponsored by this committee on behalf of the Governor's Office of Economic Development and then heard in this committee on February 18th. Senate Bill 24 revises various provisions governing the requirements and approval of a program of workforce development and administration of the workforce innovations for a new Nevada account by the Governor's Office of Economic Development. Bill adds certain information that must be included in an application to provide a program of workforce development. It also requires any program of workforce development that may be approved by GOED to result in a post-secondary or industry recognized credential or an identifiable occupational skill that meets the applicable industry standard. It requires GOED to coordinate with relevant state agencies and review federal Warren Act notices to ensure that businesses participating in a program of workforce development meet certain criteria. Um, this provision is also subject to an amendment that we will discuss shortly. Um, the bill also establishes additional criteria for the purposes of providing a priority to certain programs of workforce development 
It requires the Board of Economic Development to define the construct for priority given to programs providing high skill and high wage jobs. It makes changes to the types of expenses that may be incurred by an authorized provider of a workforce development program. It also requires any interest or income earned on money in the WIN account, including unexpended appropriations made to the account from the state general fund to be credited to the account. Um, with respect to the amendment that I mentioned um, during the hearing, GOED did propose an amendment. Um, it's to section one, subsection four, paragraph B, specifically um, subparagraph three in that. Um, as written, uh, GOED is required to make certain assurances um, that each business for which an applicant that has submitted an application um, will provide a program of workforce recruitment and assessment um, that meets the criteria there in items one through three. And three currently requires that the business has not conducted any layoffs in the 12 months immediately preceding the date of the application. The job categories related to the proposed program of workforce recruitment, assessment, and training. And in the amendment, um, just makes it so that the business would have to provide a report outlining the basis for any furloughs or layoffs in the 12 months immediately preceding the application. And with that, Madam Chair, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. But so, um, Mr. Real, uh, thank you for the amendment, but I wanted to propose a second amendment. Is that possible to do that right now? Absolutely, Madam Chair. So um, I wanted to propose an amendment to the bill to cap the administration fees, administrative fees to 10%. That excludes the fee, the fee for marketing that would be in the budget to an institution? So, um, and then, uh, so members, are there any questions on the proposed amendment that I'm offering along with um, questions to Mr. Real? Madam Chair. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank you for the amendment that you're offering. I think it makes a lot of sense to cap the administrative um, costs associated with, with this program. So thank you for that. And, and I'm fine with the rest of the bill as well. Okay. Thank you. Members, do you have any questions for Mr. Real on the amendment or the, the proposed amendment by GOAD? Okay, seeing none, um, I will accept an, a motion to amend and do pass. Madam Chair, I could make that motion to amend and do pass with both amendments. Okay. Okay, so a first from Senator Gansert and a second from Senator Dennis. Okay, all in favor of passing Senate Bill 24 with both amendments. Madam Chair, I need to ask for the roll call vote. Oh, sorry. Madam sorry. Secretary, can you please call the roll? Yes, Chair. Senator Dennis? Yes. Senator Raddy? Yes. Senator Keekeffer? Yes. Senator Severs Gansert? Yes. Chair Neal? Yes. Okay, so seeing that this passed unanimously from committee with both amendments, um, I will give the floor statement to Senator Ganser. Is that all right? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, so now we will move into our bill presentations. We have two bills. Our first bill will be SB 117, which is by Senator Gansert, and we will open up for the hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, I think I've got it. So um, 
Uh, again, for the record, my name is Heidi Sievers Gansard. I'm the Senator from District 15 in Northern Nevada. I'm here to present Senate Bill 117. So Senate Bill 117 requires the Governor's Office of Economic Development to update the state plan more frequently. Um, I was serving as Governor Sandoval's Chief of Staff in 2011 when we passed some legislation to reorganize economic development in the state of Nevada. And, and part of that was a state plan, which is basically a strategic plan to look at um, industries and some opportunities the state may have. And we were able to publish the original state plan in 2012. And just recently, uh, Governor Sisolak and the Governor's Office of Economic Development was able to publish an update of that. So in 2021 or nine years later. Um, and as I mentioned, Nevada has some great opportunity, and when you put together a strategic plan, you can really assess that on a regional basis. And then the other piece is once you once you do your planning or your strategic planning, then you want to be able to match your workforce programs with that. And so it's really critical to do both to to look at your opportunities for current workers and new workers and tra transitioning workers. And then go ahead and put down, put together the workforce programs um, that we need to promote diversification and resiliency. Um, GOA did a really great job. I think it was a week or two ago discussing diversity, diversification in the state of Nevada. And if you remember, we looked at the Hatchman Index, and we have some neighboring states that are doing pretty well: Utah and Arizona. And our score is significantly lower. And that's really around the industries that we have and the weight or the number of employees that we have in certain sectors, and if we have some that are heavily weighted versus others. And so um, kind of looking at Northern and Southern Nevada, the diversification, if you were to look at Washoe County, um, of course it's much smaller and they've been working on diversification for years and years and years. Um, and you can see the, that they're significantly diversified and right now are experiencing an unemployment rate of about 5%. And then when you look at Clark, we still have hospitality really outweighing um, all the other industries. And so their unemployment rates are significantly higher. So there's really a story to be told between diversification and unemployment rates and, and how if we strategically plan and, and do the workforce development that we're doing now, but continue to do that and do it on an ongoing basis, we can really improve. And it is a heavy lift. It's not something that happens overnight. It's, it's a heavy lift and we have to be dedicated to that. Um, and, and with that, it's important to be updating our plan and be focused. Um, you can look at jobs and wages. So, of, of course, the economy has been quite robust for a number of years until COVID ha happened. But you can see that both we were gaining jobs, but also the, the pay rate was also increasing, which I think is really important. Um, and we even hit $36, $36 an hour for some of these new jobs that were brought to the state um, back in 2017. And so again, you know, COVID hit us really hard and we're, we've got a recovery plan for which I'm grateful that this strategic plan and matching workforce development um, against it is super important and, and really beneficial in, in good or bad times. And you can see we've got a pretty extensive list of incentives and abatements. And this again was from GOA's presentation um, to us earlier. So we, and, and you know, in talking to Michael Brown separately and then also listening to his tes testimony, we do a really good job um, around incentives and abatements as far as making sure that we require benefits be paid. We have clawback provisions, we have auditing. And so we, we really have some um, good programs and a good structure, but it's something that I think we should relook at because it has been over about a decade, I think, since we looked at these. Um, we, we tend to, to fiddle around the edges, but really not look at the whole thing. So. Um, I think it's important to review all of it. And then as far as the, uh, the abatements and incentives, I remember um, during the testimony, we heard, I believe, from Paul Potts say that some of the businesses that chose to come to Nevada, like 70%, say that the incentives and abatements were important to them to come here. And this is just sort of a simplified chart showing that um, while we may have abated $334.7 million, the new tax revenue that the state enjoyed was $1.5 uh, and then, of course, the economic impact was was significant per abated dollar too. So when you when you really start converting those numbers, when we have questions around incentives and abatements, they they need to be smart. Um, but there really is an upside if we if we do it right. And as you can see, um, we've, we've benefited greatly from some of the programs that we've had. 
So specifically, um, my bill requires that the state plan for economic development be updated at least once every three years. And the, the way the language was originally written, it used the word periodically, I believe. And then also we've got our reg regional development authorities uh, and, and that language was also very open. And so I think it's important that the RDAs um, provide their plans to the governor's office at economic development every at least every two years. Uh, and then third is again, studying the existing abatements, exemptions, and other incentives to make sure that we're on track and that we're actually responding um, and aligned with what industry wants. So strategic planning, workforce development, and then making sure that our abatements and exemptions are aligned to make sure that we get the greatest thing for our buck. So that is a summary of uh, Senate Bill 117. I'm open for questions, and I appreciate your consideration on this bill. Thank you for that. Members, any questions? Okay. I have one question, Senator Gansert. So if you're updating the plan every three years, is that enough time to see if things are working? So um, I think every two years is too frequent, but I... Can you see me now? Oh, yeah. Maybe I had to unshare. I think I, I, I didn't unshare. <laughs> I think I'm back. Um, so, you know, I, I picked three years. It could be a little bit longer, but I don't think it could be any shorter. I think it does take a little bit of time. Um, but we, what I want to make sure is that we consistently assess our strategic plan. It doesn't, we don't have to start. It's an update, really. So you can start from ground zero or you can update and kind of check what you're doing. But to, it seems like the economy changes pretty rapidly. And now because of COVID, we've seen this acceleration going to um, to AI and, and remote employment. And things look a lot different than they did a, a couple of years ago, really, or even, even, even a year ago. And so I think it's smart for us to do it more frequently. And I'm flexible as far as three years, maybe it could be four years, maybe it could be a little bit longer. But I do think we need to be consistently planning and then again, matching our workforce development programs against our strategic plan. Yes, I, I agree with you. Um, so just a quick follow-up, um, the cost to update the plans by GoEd, do you know how much that is? I've heard that on average, it could be maybe 500,000 for them to update plans. So, so I thought the last contract, of my understanding, or at least what I thought I heard, was two was two hundred thousand dollars. And so, you know, every couple of bienniums, if you update it, I think that's probably money well spent. Because again, on the other side of that, we're putting millions of dollars into um, workforce development programs because we've got state money, but we also have Department of Labor federal dollars that get pushed down for workforce development. So we need to make sure that we're spending those in the industries. And as I mentioned, this this is really a the planning itself is not the heavy lift. It's the consistency and doing it over time and keeping things updated so that we can continue to move the needle, especially in, in uh, Southern Nevada. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Senator Gansert. All right. Um, Madam Chair, I also had a question. I just didn't get off mute quickly enough. Senator Ratty. Thank you. So uh, I appreciate the, the presentation of the bill and, and thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I guess I'm curious, I think we're seeing an, emergent, an emerging body of research um, from folks like Pew Charitable Trust and others that just are questioning whether or not tax incentives or abating taxes is a successful economic development tool. And so my question is, is in the evaluation is it, you know, are we offering the right abatements or are we going to do the work to figure out if abatements really are a tool that we need to continue to use? Um, uh, thank you, Senator Ratty. So, so I think we need to look at all of the above. And I, and I do specifically remember during GoEd's testimony that they said 70% of the company said they came here in that was a driving mechanism for them was the incentives and the, and the abatements. But I think we need to look at them. And, you know, just we had a bill last session, and I think uh, maybe some of us or all of us ended up supporting that to look at the average wage and what what average wage, because I, um, especially when times were even more robust, 
we don't just want any jobs. We want jobs that are good for the quality of life and will help make our economy more resilient. So if we are to offer something, what does that look like? What kind of benefits are required? What type of wages? What level of wages are required? Um, are they jobs in certain fields? We, we know we can't get enough health care providers. But, you know, that's for sure. And we know we've got this growing um, an emergency, emerging knowledge-based economy. So uh, we really need to look at what it's going to take to support businesses here and continue to grow those, to diversify. And But I do think everything's on the table. So, so whether it's adjusting what we have, re reworking it, or maybe eliminating some of those programs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, we will, move, we will open up for support of SB 117. Are there BPS? Can you go to the phone line? Is anyone on? Yes, Chair, there are a few callers. To testify in support of SB 117, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 081. You have two minutes. You may begin. Please spell and state your name for the record. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Dylan Keith, K-E-I-T-H, policy analyst with the Vegas Chamber. The Chamber is in support of SB 117 today. As the economy continues to change and see new advancements, it is imperative for Nevada to keep up as we strive to diversify the Nevada state economy. As GOED oversees the state's preparedness to reach our goals, it is essential for the office to receive regular, in-depth briefs and for our plans to adjust accordingly. This bill ensures we continue towards a sustainable and diverse economy. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for your time. We urge your support on this piece of the legislation. Okay, thank you, caller. Next. To testify in support of SB 117, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. The line is open. However, there are no callers in support of SB 117 at this time. Okay, um, we will move to uh, opposition for SB 117. To testify in opposition to SB 117, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once more, to testify in opposition to SB 117, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the line is open. However, there are no callers in opposition to SB 17. Okay, hey, thank you for that. Uh, we will move to neutral. All right, anyone on the phone line for neutral? To testify in neutral for SB 117, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chair. The line is open. However, there are no callers in neutral testimony for SB 117 at the time. Okay, thank you for that. So, Senator Gansard, would oh, you like to have any? I'm, I'm sorry, Chair. Someone just raised their hand. Oh, for neutral? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Caller with the last three digits, 927. Please state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes. You may begin. I just wanted to give you guys an update that the YouTube is like significantly ahead of where you guys are over the phone. But my name is Hava Ahmed, H-A-W-A-H-M-A-T, and I'm here representing the Clark County Education Association. This testimony is actually in uh, support, not in neutral, just so you know, but because of the delay, that's why I'm getting it right now. Um, CCEA is testifying in support of Senate Bill 117 and thanks the sponsors for bringing this bill forth. We know now more than ever that we must develop and diversify the Nevada economy. However, we cannot let another nine years go by to decide that economic development is still a priority. By implementing SB 117, Nevada will ensure that there is flexibility available to periodically revise the plan to align with new and emerging industries. 
If we were to suggest any changes to this bill, it would be to request that those updated plans provide specific information related to progress on diversifying our economy. Economic development is not necessarily synonymous with economic diversity. We strongly believe that our state's economy must diversify so we do not experience the same drastic downturn we have experienced by relying on two industries. We would also like to suggest to the sponsor of the bill to consider adding language under Section 3 that emphasizes focus on the types of incentives that would help facilitate economic diversity in our economy. Our economy must diversify, and key to that is having a workforce with education and skills, the, excuse me, with the education and skills necessary to serve those industries and businesses. Nevada's K-12 system is the base of Nevada's K-20 education delivery system. We must strengthen the base. Now, more than ever, as legislators and the governor chart a course of recovery, investing in our state's education delivery system is paramount. Accordingly, SB 117 is a step in the right direction in monitoring our economy in a timely and surgical way. Thank you for your efforts, and we look forward to doing all that we can to support economic diversification, workforce development, and giving every student an opportunity to succeed. Thank you so much, and again, I am sorry for the delay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. BPS, is anyone else just kind of hanging out there? No, Chair, uh, there's no one else on the, the line to testify. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Senator Gansard, any closing remarks? Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I appreciate you um, hearing the bill today and I would appreciate your support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so we will close the hearing on SB 117 and open up for SB 74. Greetings, Senator Neal and members of the Senate Revenue Committee. For the record, my name is Melanie Young, Executive Director for the Nevada Department of Taxation. I'm here along with members of my team, Chief Deputy Shelley Hughes, Deputy Director Dave Prather, um, Jeff Hardcastle, the state demographer, and Kevin Williams, the management analyst responsible for our distribu tax distributions. We are here to present SB 74, which revises the provisions where population is used for certain tax distributions. This is a housekeeping bill that cleans up language that aligns with how the department is processing those tax distributions. Over the past two years, the executive team at the department has been working on reviewing our processes. This review is in large in part due to our, if, to become more efficient and modernize the department in an anticipation of our IT modernization project. With that being said, a while back, we asked our internal auditor to audit some of our processes. During this audit, it was discovered the department was not following the law. This bill removes the language enacted in 1999 for utilizing the Census Bureau population numbers as the department has not used those population numbers in the state tax revenue distribution process. We have always used the state demographer certified population numbers and there are many reasons for this. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Chief Deputy Shelley Hughes who will go through the provisions of the bill and, ex and explain the circumstances around this request. Good afternoon, Chair Neal and committee members. My name is Shelley Hughes, Chief Deputy for the Department of Taxation. I am here today to introduce SB 74. SB 74 clarifies the population totals certified by the governor annually are to be used in determining the allocation and deposit of proceeds of the basic city county relief tax and SB 74 revises provisions governing the population totals used in determining the distribution of certain taxes. The requested changes are to statutes that govern the distribution of state taxes, and the changes do not have any impact on how the popula population totals are arrived at, nor do the changes impact the local government's petition and appeal rights of the population totals. Existing law requires that population totals be used for the distribution of certain taxes. In several provisions of the NRS, such as NRS 360, 690, and 377057, the population totals to be used are the population totals certified by the governor, 
unless those totals conflict with the Bureau of Census totals. In the case of the conflict, the Bureau of Census totals must be used. NRS 360-285, subsection 2, provides that the department must use the population total certified by the governor for any tax that is collected for apportionment in whole or in part to any political subdivision where the basis of the apportionment is the population of the political subdivision. Walking through the bill, Section 1 amends NRS 360-690, subsection 8, and eliminates for certain taxes the requirement to use the population totals of the Bureau of the Census of the United States Department of Commerce in case of conflict with the population totals of the governor. Section 2 amends NRS 377-055 and clarifies that the population totals used to make these determinations are the population totals certified by the governor annually. Section 3 amends NRS 377-057 and eliminates the requirement to use the population totals of the Bureau of Census in the case of conflict with the population totals of the governor. Section 4 provides that the bill is effective upon passage and approval. The department through the state demographer annually determines the population of each town, township, city, or county. Once the demographer has determined the population, it is submitted to the governor who certifies the population totals on or before March 1st of each year as required by NRS 360-285. The department uses the governor's certified population totals every year to determine the calculation of distributions for the basic city county relief tax, the supplemental city county relief tax, and to local governments for money remaining after base monthly allocations. Since the Census Bureau totals have never been used since the enactment of this language in the 1990s, the department finds this to be a housekeeping matter. We discovered that we were not using the Bureau of Census totals after our internal auditor performed an internal audit of our distributions. However, we thought we were properly calculating these distributions because a similar provision in RS 360-285 subsection 2 provides that the department must use the population total certified by the governor for any tax that is collected for apportionment in whole or in part to any political subdivision where the basis of the apportionment is a population of the political subdivision. There are several problems with using census decennial totals and annual census estimates, most notably timing. The governor's certified population totals for the current year are based on population totals from two fiscal years prior. If we were to use census decennial totals and annual census estimates, these are based off the current year. Would we use census totals two fiscal years behind to correlate with the governor's certified population totals? Additionally, the governor's certified totals are released March 1st for counties, incorporated cities, and unincorporated towns. Census annual estimates for counties are released in March, and incorporated city estimates are released in May. And the Census Bureau does not produce decennial totals or annual census estimates for unincorporated towns. Furthermore, census totals are continually updated, so it causes problems on what date those totals should be retrieved. Another problem is the mandatory language in NRS 360-285, which requires the department to use governor certified population totals for any tax that is collected for apportionment, where the basis of apportionment is the population. While the census language in NRS 360-690 and NRS 377-057 deals with calculating population change, it is, it is inconsistent with the language in NRS 360-285. It is not clear why would we, we would use the governor's certified population for apportionment purposes, then use census totals to calculate the population change over a five-year period. Next, the language is unclear when census totals should be used to determine if there's a conflict between census totals and the governor certified population totals. Is it every year and we use annual census estimates instead of the governor certified totals? Or is it every 10 years and we use decennial totals and then use governor certified totals in off years? Then the problem becomes if it is determined that decennial census totals and annual census estimates are to be used every year, determining whether there is a conflict. In reality, the decennial census totals and the annual census estimates will always be in conflict with the governor's certified population totals. Thus, according to NRS 360-690 and 377-057, decennial census totals and annual census estimates should always be used. 
The city totals would be used every 10 years and annual census estimates would be used in off years. The problem with using annual census estimates is annual census estimates do not include estimate populations of unincorporated towns. So governor certified totals would have to be used for those population totals. Again, this causes a problem because the governor certified totals are calculated based on the population for the two fiscal years prior and the census totals are calculated for the current year. Again, we will have to determine if the statute requires that we use census totals two fiscal years behind to correlate with the governor's certified population totals. Alternating between census totals and governor's certified totals and the calculation of the distributions becomes a difficult task. We would not have consistent statistical algorithms year to year. And finally, if census totals are only to be used in decennial years, then the governor's certified totals could be used in off years, but then we encounter two problems inconsistencies for moving from the, the decennial census totals to the governor's totals and a timing difference regarding the decennial census totals based on the current year and the governor's totals being two fiscal years behind. Again, we would have to determine if the statute requires that we use census totals two fiscal years behind to correlate with the governor's certified population totals. Additionally, the Bureau of Census continually updates the census totals so these totals can change. So we would have to continually update the population totals when calculating the distribution. Uh, the legislative history of the current law. So uh, AB 721 from 1969 was codified as NRS 360-285, was enacted to require where any tax collected for apportionment, the population would be determined by the last preceding national census of the Bureau of Census. Transition from one such census to the next was required on July 1st of the year, following the year in which the census was taken. Every payment prior to such date shall be based upon the earlier census, and every payment after such date shall be based upon the latter census. AB 322 from 1983, in which the language of NRS 360-285 was changed, required where any tax collected for apportionment the population would be determined by the governor certified population instead of the census totals. SB 494 in 1987 allowed for the appeal population determinations prior to being certified by the governor and allowed the department to hire the demographer. AB 832 in 1989 changed the certification date to February 1st. And then AB 82 in 1991 changed the certification date to the current date of March 1st. AB 369 in 1981, codified as NRS 377-057, was enacted as part of a comprehensive tax reform package sought to limit taxes on real property and increase sales tax. As originally enacted in NRS 377, the statute required the governor to certify the population of each county annually. The statute did not contain any reference to the census. AB 506 in 1993 added language to NRS 377057, requiring that the census totals be used if the census totals were in conflict with the totals certified by the governor. The bill was enacted to correct errors made in another assembly bill from a prior session. In, a, in an amendment to the bill, the census language was added. There is no discussion of the use of the census totals in the legislative history, nor was there any discussion of any issues arising from the use of population figures certified by the governor. Thus, it is unclear why this change was made. SB 254 in 1997, codified as NRS 360-690, had added language to require census totals to be used if in conflict with the governor certified totals. The legislative history of this bill contained no discussion as to why. SB 538 in 1999, codified as NRS 360-690, clarified when census totals were to be used. Here in the legislative history, the Senate Committee on Taxation Minutes of April 6, 1999, Teresa Glazner from the Department of Taxation said that the governor's certified totals were used until the census totals were released, then the formula would be reestablished based on the census totals. In the Senate Committee on Taxation Minutes of April 8, 1999 for SB 538, there was a discussion about when census totals should be used. There was a discussion that using estimates may be unconstitutional. The chair of the committee clarified that when census figures were current, they were used, and in off years, the state demographer would provide totals which were certified by the governor. 
The legislative history for NRS 360-690 appears to suggest that the legislative intent was to use decennial totals every 10 years and then governor certified totals in off years. With no discussion in the legislative history of NRS 377-057, can we assume that the legislative intent was to also use the decennial census totals every 10 years and then governor certified totals in off years? With SB 74, we would like to remove the language that indicates that the Bureau of Census population totals will be used when they are in conflict with the governor certified population totals. This language occurs both in NRS 377-057 and NRS 360-690. There are several reasons why we believe there will not be a negative impact if this language is removed. First, during our research, we cannot find where the department has ever used the census totals. Based on the legislative history for 360-690, the census total should have been used in 2000, 2010, and now 2020. However, this issue was brought to our attention by our internal auditor and not an outside party that was affected by the use of our governor certified totals. Second, the legislative history of NRS 360-690 suggests the census language was added to reach a more accurate population total. However, there isn't any reference to why the language was added to 377057. With the addition of the demographer to the department in 1987, and in the ability for the local governments to appeal the population totals before they are certified by the governor, pursuant to NRS 360-283, subsection 3, and NAC 360-390, these actions ensure more accurate totals will be reached. Based on these reasons, we cannot determine any negative impact if the census language is removed in both statutes. In fact, we determined there would be a positive impact if we remove the language. The change would harmonize NRS 377-057 and NRS 360-690 with other tax statutes, such as NRS 360-285. No other allocation provisions in NRS 377 or NRS 360 reference using census totals. Removing the language would assist in carrying out the original intent of NRS 377-057, as shown in the statute's legislative history. Removing the language would allow for timely, consistent, and clear distributions. In summary, we are requesting to remove the language present in both NRS 377-057 and NRS 360-690 that indicates that the Bureau of Census population totals will be used when they are in conflict with the governor's certified population totals. And we request that the language in NRS 377-055 clarify that only the governor certified population totals will be used. Uh, we thank you for your consideration today and I will turn it back to Director Young. Thank you for the record, Melanie Young, Executive Director for the Nevada Department of Taxation. And we thank you for your time and discussion on this statutory change. We realize that this is a hard conversation to have by coming forward requesting this change that removes language implemented in 1999 that the department never implemented for the distribution process of state tax revenues to local governments. When our internal auditor brought this to our executive team's attention, we investigated the matter, reviewed it, the requirements. If we were to implement the statute and the issues around implementing became readily apparent, we believe that if the statutory provisions were implemented, the department and or local governments would have come forward during a legislative session to make those changes. We believe this, again, this is a housekeeping matter as Shelley um, Hughes had indicated, is the department has never used the Bureau of Census totals in the state distribution process. Our goal of this bill is to align the statutes with our processes with no impact to local governments. Currently, the way the statute is written, it makes the calculation of the distribution process mathematically problematic. And if the Census Bureau totals were to use, as Shelley discussed, there's timing issues of when they're published and that they're continually updated, which creates conflicts in the population numbers of when to use them. And at what point in time is that data developed for? Additionally, the U.S. Census Bureau does not determine the population of towns and townships, which is used in our distribution of tax revenues where the, the governor certified population numbers do. Since we've all used the governor certified population numbers and will continue to do so if this bill is passed, there should be no effect on local governments. 
Furthermore, the population counts developed by the state demographer and certified by the governor, the local governments have a local due process rights and they have the ability to appeal to the department their population counts, thus giving them in-state due processes. The department also has defined regulatory processes on how those population numbers are determined. And we thank you for your time consideration of this request. And this concludes our presentation and we have our team ready to answer your questions that you may have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that, um, Director Young. So before we get to questions committee, I want um, Mr. Gindin to um, share some charts that kind of it's like we're gonna do a show and tell version of what the law would have done. Um, and so Mr. Gindin, can you um, share the chart um, table one? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you for the record. Russell Gindin, Principal Deputy Fiscal Analyst with the Fiscal Analysis Division. And what you should see here is table one and you, there's five different documents that are provided uh, today. And the, res the results in these tables come out of uh, when uh, Melanie Young and her staff uh, from taxation uh, let us know that this bill would be coming forward. And then we started working uh, in terms of the discussions. Um, and so your staff has gone through and reviewed the legislative history too that's been compiled by your research library staff. And we would concur that there does not seem to be testimony on the record to why this uh, census language was, is added to the uh, SCCRT distributions in uh, 1993, and believe it was probably just picked up and carried forward into the CTAX uh, second tier distribution calculations when that law was established in 1997. Um, and before I start going to the table, I think one of the things that semantics can come into play here is you keep hearing the word census. I bet you if you would ask the average person, they would think what's going on, it's the decennial census not realizing that you actually have a U.S. Census Bureau that's doing the census, and then that Census Bureau is actually producing calendar year estimates for states and counties uh, in, in the cities in those counties. So I, I think that is, as uh, Shelly Hughes and Director Young uh, testified that uh, what is meant by the word census and census estimates and census population estimates. So as we tried to work to it and based on the, the, the direction of uh, Chair Neal, we attempted to see, could we go put some data that would help uh, visually allow the members of this committee to understand what the issue is that's going on here. Uh, so what you have in uh, front of you uh, on the screen here, and it's also available in Nellis, is table one. So the top part of the table, uh, table 1A, shows the population estimates that were prepared by the state demographer highlighted there in orange on the left side of the table. Uh, and these would have been the estimates that were certified by the governor for uh, July 2015 and July 2016 that would have been used to do the actual SCCRT guarantee and non-guarantee county distribution calculations for FY 2018. Uh, and so then to the right of that, highlighted in the yellow block uh, at the top, you, those are the current U.S. Census Bureau estimates for July 2015 and July 2016. And as was mentioned, I, I used, you see I say they're the current estimates because the Census Bureau can, they intermittently, they're updating or revising or changing their estimates for these years. And versus the demographer's estimates when they're certified by the governor for a July 1st date they're certified, that, that's, that's the estimate and they're not revised. So as was mentioned, that's one of the issues that taxation noted is to uh, um, create some mathematical issue with regard to calculations. So given that these would have been the estimates used for the FY 2018 uh, SCCRT, you, just to go look here at Clark, uh, you have the two estimates for those two uh, calendar years uh, done at July of each year for Clark. And so I have the hand on him here. So you, and so you can see the growth rate is 2.26%. Uh, 
If you go over to Clark under the census estimates, uh, you can see that those estimates are lower and the growth rate's lower. And so I think logically people go, well, if the, if the estimate is higher, then the growth rate is higher. But you can see that that's one of the issues here is that the law that, that taxation is, is referencing is talking about estimates. The distributions are done on percent changes. And so that's what's important here. So because right if we go down to Douglas, so Douglas's estimates by the demographer are higher than the census. But you can see that the growth rate coming out of the demographer's estimates is 0.02% versus it's 0.91% for the census. So thus you can see where you have situations that, that the law says that if, the, and this is just one interpretation that the Fiscal Analysis Division staff Department of Taxation went, this might be sort of a non-lawyer, plain reading person who had to do the math would read this language and say, this is what we think it would tell you to do. So if that was true, then you'd come and get the census estimates and you'd say, well, they're in conflict because they're different. And they're always going to be in conflict because I think it would be a statistically odd result that the Census Bureau and the state demographer have the same estimates for every entity in the state, right? So thus it's almost by default, the statutory provision will say that they're in default, that they're in conflict, thus you must use the census. And so I would also offer here before I move on is that as, as Director Young noted that there is the petition process when the state demographer is preparing the estimates for the local government entity to petition that estimate for review. So if that process would actually occur where the local government petitions to have their estimates prepared by the state demographer reviewed, and it went through that review process, and there was uh, uh, the final estimate that from the state demographer, that local government, and you implemented this statutory provision, the, the way we're looking at it here is somewhat of a plain reading, it would nullify that state demographer's estimate because you'd have to then go use the census estimate. And so I just wanted to go through that as your fiscal staff to go, it's it's not clear from reading the record what really the the intent was. And as was pointed out, is it to use the 10 year decennial? Uh, well, that would create, I think, mathematical issues. So that's just, you can come down. And then, so if you go to the next table, uh, table 1B, you can see Clark, the state demographer's estimates are still greater than the demo, than the census. But the growth rate under the census is now higher. It's 2% versus 1.28%. So with the, in these two years, you the demographer's estimates were always higher than the census, but yet the growth rates are flipping between whose was higher. But uh, if you would interpret these, these statutory provisions this way, you would have to use the census estimates and then the census growth rates. Because again, the SCCERT distribution is based on growth rates, not the actual count of the people. It's the change in the count of the people. So then to, uh, let me bring up the next document. And so, and don't worry, I'm not going to go through all these. Um, so what this table does, and let me try and blow it up here again. This is for FY 2018. Just again, try and get some information out there for the, the committee members as well as others. Uh, here's the SCCRT. And right, these are the six revenue sources that go into the first tier of the C-tax distribution. Mr. Gindin, can you blow it up just a little bit? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and what's I would also point out for as your fiscal staff uh, that taxation did not make this point, but the out-of-state basic city county relief tax and the local government portion of the cigarette tax and the local government portion of the liquor tax are also required to be distributed on a per capita basis. But there are no census type provisions in those chapters for those taxes with regards to this census thing. So, so that's just to me as your staff another oddity that you have three other revenue sources that are going to be distributed on a per capita basis, uh, not growth rates, but on a per capita basis, but there's nothing about, oh, well, if there's a conflict, use the census for those three taxes. And again, I think part of this is 
you have people interacting here that weren't around when this was originally put in place. So to what the, the logic or intent was, but that's more just an observational fact of noting. So then what this table 2A is, uh, that this is the actual SCCR distributions that were done using the demographer's estimates for FY 2018. And again, the green shaded counties, I should have noted in table one, these are the eight guaranteed counties. So they're, they're the ones that are guaranteed an amount, and that amount is adjusted for one plus the growth in the, uh, the lesser of the growth in the CPI and population, or one plus the growth in the pr uh, prior period's SCCRT collections. So every year that you take what they got last year and you're adjusting that for either the growth in population and, and inflation or the growth in prior SCCRT collections. So then you come down to table 2B, this is the supplemental city county relief that would have been done using those estimates from uh, table 1A for the census. So then the, the uh, important thing probably is, is okay, table 2 uh, oops, table 2C here shows you the difference. So this would be the difference using the census estimates versus what was actually distributed using the demographer's estimates. So you can see what this is, is under the 377.057 the provisions, it's about changing the amount of money that would go to the guaranteed. And then out of that formula comes changing the amount that would go to the non-guaranteeds under the, the statutory prop uh, formula for the, the guarantee versus non-guarantee calculation of the SCCRT at the first tier. So you can see for this particular year, under this simulation, it's pretty de minimis. Now you can look across the entities, but for the guarantees and a sum, it's less than $14,000. And then that has to be spread across the non-guarantees because within these distributions, it's a zero sum game. So that's that's the SCRT. So this would be reflecting uh, the 377.057 under this interpretation that's shown here that, oh, if the estimates are different, that's a conflict. Go use the census estimates, but it's not, you're using those census estimates to calculate growth rates and then driving those growth rates through the statutory formulas. So then table three just shows you the results for FY 2019. Uh, I won't bring that one up. You can look yourself, but there the uh, net change for the guarantees was around $227,000. So again, relatively de minimis of, uh, by changing the, the population estimates, again, under this interpretation of the provisions. So then the other uh, part of the bill, it, as was discussed, is the changes for, in this one I might have to leave a little smaller, uh, for the, the 360, 690 provisions. And that's what we call the second tier of the C-tax distribution. Uh, so 360, 680 actually determines the base amount for each local government entity. And then uh, 360, 690 is how to distribute that base. And then if there's more money to distribute than the base, that's called excess. And so there are statutory formulas and provisions for the formulas that you must work through to calculate the excess distribution shares for the uh, county cities and towns and special districts who would share in any excess that would be available for distributing uh, in any specific month of a fiscal year. So as was noticed that uh, under the SCCRT, the percent change is only for one year. For the uh, excess distribution calculation in 360-690, it's the five-year average growth rate in population. So you can now see what that would say is, well, you're taking uh, six years worth of population data to calculate five growth rates and then average over. So now to walk over to the census side, uh, Kevin Williams and I had to do the same thing. Uh, he and I to go get those census estimates and calculate this, these five-year growth rates. So that's what table four that I have up here shows you. Again, in the orange, this was the this is 
the actual demographers five year based on the actual demographers governor certified estimates this would be the five year average growth rate for the distribution that was done for fy 2018 in terms of using this population factor to calculate the excess distribution share the yellow then is the census population estimates five-year average so this table just allows you to walk through and see what is the difference in the population change uh, in these five-year average growth rates here in the left-hand side for FY 2018 on the right-hand side for FY 2019. And so you'll see in the table, I'll flip down to the next page, uh, as was mentioned uh, by uh, Shelly Hughes, that I designed this table to tell how, how people try and grasp the understanding of what was verbally said here about the Census Bureau is only doing estimates for counties and cities. Thus, that, But the demographer is required to do them for towns, and those town population growth rates that you can see here are actually used to calculate the excess distribution shares for towns. No such counterpart exists that's prepared by the Census Bureau. So th thus, as was mentioned, that I, I would offer that there'd be a mathematical oddity going on here that you would be required if, under this interpretation to go, well, you gotta go replace the census estimates because they don't equal the demographers and use that five-year average growth rate for the counties and cities, but you're still going to use the demographers for the towns. And then for inter enterprise districts and special districts, population is not involved at all in their distribution shares for the, the, the tax distributions. So I think you, when you start to look at this, it's, it's just math, but the math would start to result in, I think, oddities of the distributions. And I think in some sense, um, had taxation administered this, I believe, yes, there would, it, there would have been amendments to it sometime in the past, possibly even repealed, given the discussion that's going on here, just because of uh, what we see. So I just wanted to go through how you're reading this table, as that's what's going on, is you don't have some of the information for some entities from the census as you do for the others. So you're, I would argue you're getting a little bit of apples to oranges here in terms of the math that would start to be required to do the calculations. And remember, these are the growth rates that are going to be used to, to drive the money around amongst these, this excess money around amongst the locals at the second tier. So then the, the question really becomes, well, okay, that, that's the second tier. Um, what does that mean for the dollars? And so that's what the final table does. Oops, apologize. Um, so this takes the those five-year average growth rates, and again, the orange is what those those five-year average growth rates driving them through the second-tier C tax calculation for excess, and doing the distribution. So this is the actual. So the yellow then is simulating if you took the five-year average growth rate from census and driving that through. So then here in the light gray, you see the dollar difference. And then in the dark gray, you're seeing the percent difference. And so what I will note that if you're looking at this table, go, well, that's odd that the, the, the number from table 2C was 300, minus $302 for Carson and then it was the minus uh, $4,940 for FY19, that's exactly what should happen. Because if that's going to be the change in the SCCRT amount of the first tier, that has to be the amount that's being driven through at the second tier. But there are other shifts occurring here because as these population five-year average growth rates are changing, they're going to create winners and losers of the amount of money that's being distributed of the excess uh, between those entities. And so I'll leave it to you to go through the tables, but you can see that on average, these results are fairly de minimis when you look across all the different local governments to which these calculations are going, because I'll just, I, I scrolled to, here's Clark County, uh, in terms of the amount that you're, you're, that's moving around at the second tier because of your changing the excess distribution share. And, and again, um, 
this is the information that I wanted to present in these tables to, to try and help the members as well as others that are out there uh, looking at this bill and the hearing and, and what its intent is. And, and I would agree that, you know, what this bill does is it's not changing at all the process that the state demographer is required to do under NRS and NAC for producing the estimates or the review process that's allowed by local governments. It would be, if this bill was passed, to remove this type of calculation and the implications that would occur amongst the local governments by the census essence being required to trump the uh, demographer's estimates in terms of the use for the SCCRT distribution and for the excess distribution share calculations. And with that, Madam Chair, I can uh, attempt to answer any questions that the members of the committee may have. And I appreciate you allowing me the chance to present this information. So. Thank you, uh, Mr. Gindin. So members, questions. So we have two parts to this conversation, right? The questions uh, to uh, Director Young's executive team. Um, also, Mr. Hardcastle's on, who's a demographer, and Mr. Gindin. So, all right, if you're still, if you're still there, uh, I think it's interesting, but I'm special. So we will open up for any questions. Madam Chair, this is Senator Ratty. So I thought it might just be helpful to summarize to make sure that I'm understanding it and importantly that everybody else is understanding it, um, particularly local governments who are maybe concerned. So basically an auditor found a discrepancy between the way we're actually doing it and what it says in the law, which left the Department of Taxation with two choices, either change the law or change the way that we're doing it. They looked at the way they were doing it and based on their analysis and Mr. Gindin's analysis, that would result in some oddities, I think is the phrase I'm gonna pull out of Russell's presentation. And it was not practical to change our process to align with the law. So we are actually, we are asking to change the law to align with the current process. Is that an accurate reflection of what's happening here? I say yes, but Director Young, would you like to do? <laughs> Thank you, Melanie Young, Executive Director for the record. Um, Senator Ratty, yes. That is an accurate summation of, of this bill. And we will, no local government will would see any change in how we are doing it compared to last year. No, that was our goal from this, is that because we're already doing this process, it's a sound process. It's um, about, we, we've gone through all the, the different elements of it. And so we will stay consistent with what we're doing today. So they should not see a change or an impact from this. Thank you. Okay, members, any other questions? Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Kitty Kepper. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I think you started off, Director Young, by saying that this won't, um, or the intent is not to change any um, appeal rights of local governments. I know that um, they, they have a process, right, by which they can appeal the, um, the estimate their population and probably I assume they would appeal it if it goes downward and they don't agree with that. Um, can you talk about that process a little bit and um, and how often it gets used? Thank you, Melanie Young, Executive Director for the record. Um, thank you, Senator Keefer, for the question. Um, I'm gonna talk about two separate processes uh, a little bit and then I'll turn it over to my expert, uh, Jeff Hardcastle, who handles that. So when it comes to the federal census process, there is everybody can appeal to that process to the U.S. Census Bureau. But then when it comes to the Department of Taxation's processes, um, it is outlined in statute and in NAC that gives local governments the ability to appeal um, how we determine the population. And so that's done um, through the annual process where Jeff Hardcastle sends out the estimates. He has conversations with the local governments 
and um, they can appeal. That hearing would go to administrative law judge who would hear um, the both sides of the story and then come up with a resolution. And so what I'd like to do is um, bring in Jeff Hardcastle who can talk about more in detail about exactly what that process is and how many times that's happened. Sure, for the record, Jeff Hardcastle, Nevada State Demographer. Um, under NEC, um, Nevada Administrative Code, the estimates go out on the first business day of December. And then there's a two week period for local governments to start reviewing the estimates and, and, and provide their initial set of questions or feedback. And then if it looks like it's going to be, if there's not a resolution during that, that initial two week period, there then from roughly December 14th, or I think this year was the 16th, there's a 30 day time frame for the demographer and local governments to try to resolve any um, concerns or, or questions that they've raised. If it hasn't been resolved by that end of that 30 day period, it then goes to an administrative uh, hearing through the administrative judge in taxation. And depending on the findings of that administrative judge and it, what the local government wants to do as a result of that, they can then appeal that decision to the Nevada Tax Commission. So there's um, the time frame to work with them initially and present to them the estimates and work with them on reviewing the estimates and resolving any initial questions because sometimes it turns out I misentered some data from the local assessor or whatever. And or then that 30 day window to have a uh, more longer discussion where they can provide more data um, we can go back and forth some, but like I say, if there's not a resolution because of the March t one time point for certification, there has to be that trigger of the appeal hearing. The only formal appeal hearings that have actually been have been in 2002 with the cities of uh, from Clark County, and that did not go actually to a full hearing, but they met with the director at that time and, and uh, myself up in Carson City uh, about the estimates. And then there was a hearing from the city of Mesquite, I believe that was in 2012. And then in, um, I believe it was 2015 or 16, uh, the city of Elko appealed and that went to an administrative judge hearing as well. So it was just the Mesquite hearing and the Elko hearings that actually went forward. Um, and all both those appeals were found uh, by the administrative judge to um, uphold the estimate that was, you know, submitted to them. Because what will happen at times is that even with that discussion, you provide them an alternative estimate, and what happens is because everybody wants more more people they will still go and push the envelope to try to get even more during that 30-day that window. And so sometimes that's like with the city of Elko where they went ahead and went to the appeal hearing. Hey, I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, any additional questions? So uh, I just had one quick question and I guess it would be to uh, Ms. Hughes. Um, number one, thank you for the legislative history. Um, that was really great. But in, in 2011, that was my first session. Um, we, we had the CTEX discussion and there were some changes. W were there any minutes that popped up in that discussion around this issue or no? Shelly Hughes, for the record, um, during my research, I did not find any minutes um, that popped up around this discussion um, in, in those minutes from 2011. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate it. I liked your presentation. I like lead history. So, all right. So we will open up this hearing <laughs> for anyone who has signed in for support for SB 74. To testify in support of SB 74, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Again, to testify in support of SB 74, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the public line is open. However, no callers are raising their hand to testify in support at this time. Okay, thank you for that. So we will move to opposition. To testify in opposition to SB 74, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 087. Please state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes. You may begin. Caller with the last three digits, 087. Please state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes. You may begin. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Jared Luke, the Director of Government Affairs for the City of North Las Vegas, J-A-R-E-D-L-U-K-E. -E. I'm calling in opposition of Senate Bill 74 as it is currently written. We've had many conversations with the Department of Taxation, including earlier today, and I want to thank the Executive Director, Melanie Young, and her staff for helping us uh, understand what is a very complex model and has been a month-long conversation to understand that model. We understand that this is a difficult conversation to have. Uh, we understand that Senate Bill 74 is intended to be a housekeeping bill, but it proposes the removal of the dependence on the Census Bureau numbers, which serve as a, a check. We can argue legislative intent um, all day long, but I, I think that the census the decennial census numbers are to serve as a check uh, for the uh, population estimates. Um, by doing so, it exposes the fact that there is a lack of checks in the state demographer's regression model or process by which the department arrives at a population estimate. You know, this bill does not answer the question that if the census numbers are removed, what process or safeguard takes its place to check the regression model and inputs that seem to change year after year? For example, this year's regression model for Clark County posted or provided five justified data ranges for rate of growth between negative 0.4% and as high as 13.2%, a much higher average rate than we have seen historically, a range difference of 625,000 residents in Clark County alone, more than the entire population of Washoe County, or more than all of the counties in Nevada combined, excluding Washoe and Clark. We believe this leaves the door open for wide, uh, open wide for interpretation. Without a transparent, reliable standard for inputs and a regression model, we fear that the Senate Bill 74, as proposed today, will only add to existing confusion in regards to sea tax disbursement uh, and population estimates, as well as overload the state and Department of Taxation with increasing appeals and review requests year after year. Sea tax, as you know, is one of the primary ways in which local government forecasts to provide equitable essential services for, community, for the community and is heavily impacted by population rate of change. We feel that this is a larger and more in-depth conversation to be had. And as written, we, uh, we oppose uh, Senate Bill 74. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller. Um, Director Young, would you like to um, try to get some clarifying information on the record to that? So thank you, I'm Melanie Young, Executive Director for the Nevada Department of Taxation. And we did meet with um, the city of North Las Vegas earlier today, Jared Luke, and had um, conversations with them about this. And, um, you know, the department has its regulatory process and outlines what uh, the demographer Jeff Hardcastle goes through is his model. There are conversations that uh, Mr. Hardcastle continually has with the local um, developing uh, uh, planning departments within each local government so that the information that he has can be prepared consistently um, throughout this process. And so, um, you know, I, I can acknowledge that, you know, the conversation that City of North Las Vegas has that it believes that this, uh, the census, per, um, per the decennial census provides a, a check and balance in that 
Um, and, you know, we would be willing to have further conversations on this matter to make sure that um, the money that is distributed to the local governments um, is done so in a fair and efficient process. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Hartcastle, any comments towards? Thank you, Madam Chair. Jeff Hardcastle, for the record. Um, just to follow up uh, with what Director Young had said, um, you know, we did have extensive conversations with the city of North Las Vegas. Uh, over the years, their staff member, Johanna Murphy, and now uh, Sherry Ann uh, Dotson have been contributing to the local population estimates. The Clark County uh, is one of the two jurisdictions in the state that does their own housing unit based population estimate. and. Um, you know, that process and working with the local governments down there um, has been at times, uh, you know, a little bit of tug of war at times, but we do tend to work pretty well over time. And I think we continue to have that dialogue and there's nothing wrong with continuing to have that conversation as Director Young said. Thank you for that. Um, I know North Las Vegas, City of North Las Vegas uploaded a letter. Um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to read it. They talked about the regression models. I don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the, I guess, why they think there's a need for, to keep that check. But um, I hope you guys can address that because they talked about the spread. I guess there's like a 13 point spread, Mr. Hardcastle. Um, in in the numbers, and I guess I don't I don't understand that um, the wideness of that, but um, the deviations. But maybe you can uh, just for this just for the legislative record and some completeness um, try to you know have an explanation there. So if somebody somebody reads this later, they can understand what that chart was that went in. And they would know that that explanation came from um, our state demographer. Um, Have you seen? You. That? Pardon, Madam Chair. Did you see the exhibit? I did not see the exhibit yet. It may, uh, Jeff Hardcastle again for the record. Um, I did not see the exhibit yet, but it may be what they had provided in their appeal letter. Um, the, in working with and, and because part of the process that that goes on with the Clark County folks, because they are the jurisdiction that puts in probably the most staff effort into their local housing unit estimate, they have a, every um, quarterly now a group of people at the staff level that meets and annually uh, I present the population estimates to that group. And this year I was, and I've always been transparent as possible in presenting them the alternatives for the regression side of things uh, to get some feedback because at times there can be some closeness and that's part of the estimate. And this year I was probably not as, as uh, judicious as I've been in the past. And I just showed them the full range of everything I looked at. It was totally transparent just showing the full range of everything that came up. Um, you know, and I think a couple of them were actually, uh, as Joanna Murphy walked me through some of her questions and asked me some very good questions, the, the planner from North, the city of North Las Vegas. And we clarified that a couple of things I'd done were actually data entry errors. Um, so again, I was being transparent and, and probably oversharing information that I should have been much more careful and just shown what was the best fitting models and not the full range and some things that were nonsensical. It was a lack of judgment on my part for doing that probably. Okay, thank, thank you for that. All right, uh, so BPS, is anyone else uh, calling in for opposition? Yes, Chair, there's one more caller with a hand raised. Caller with the last three digits, 475. Please state and spell your name. You may begin. Madam Chair and members of the committee, for the record, Kelly Crompton representing the city of Las Vegas. That's K-E-L-L-Y-C-R-O-M-P-T-O-N. Um, we'd like to thank um, the bill sponsors and the committee um, for their time in presenting this bill. 
Um, and after li hear listening to the hearing, we have a bit, of, a bit more understanding of the intent of the legislation. We agree with the presenters there are oddities and a need for housekeeping within the law. Um, we still have a concern with the process of the state demographer utilizes. It's for those reasons that we're expressing our opposition to this bill as it is written um, as a result of moving, removing the decennial census from the process. We believe it does serve, um, as North Las Vegas stated, as at least some form of a check on the state demographer's annual population estimates. The city of Las Vegas submitted an appeal to the state demographer late last year um, of its population estimates based upon one of the allowable criteria um, in an incorrect assumption was made in developing the process, proposed estimates. According to our appeal, the, the appeal, the draft 2020 estimates were generated based upon multiple runs of economic regression model with multiple variable combinations. However, the outcome of these multiple runs that was ultimately selected is not the most statistically significant model. In fact, in our view, statistical significance does not appear to be the determining factor when selecting from multiple outcomes. And further, the variables used in the economic regression model are inconsistent from year to year. The inconsistency in the method methodology results in the selection of data inputs that appear to be arbitrary. Um, we had a couple of questions that North Las Vegas addressed and, and Madam Chair, you asked the sponsors to um, discuss, so we'll um, leave it with. We would very much welcome the opportunity to work closely with the committee and the presenters in the Department of Taxation to ensure a better and more transparent, more consistent, and more reliable process for determining annual population figures, which are critical in distributing taxes as well as formulated grants from a variety of different governmental agencies. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for that. BPS, is anyone else signed in in opposition? If you are just joining us, we are currently on public comment for opposition for SB 74. If you would like to take your place in the queue to testify in opposition to SB 74, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Thank you, Chair. There are no more callers in opposition to SB 74 at this time. Okay, so we will move to neutral. If you would like to testify in neutral to SB 74, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you would like to testify in neutral for SB 74, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you for that. So, uh, Director Young, closing comments on anything to wrap this hearing up, uh, clarifying statements to put people at ease. I know the one question I want you to put back on the record is, does this change prohibit using the census information or estimates? Thank you, Melanie Young, Executive Director for the Nevada Department of Taxation. Um, what I would like to do is um, have Jeff Hardcastle provide some final clarifying information, and then I'll close up if, if that's all right with the chair. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Jeff Hardcastle. Um, for the record, Nevada State Demographer, just to Clarify, you had asked earlier about putting in information to, in, in on the record regarding the appeal from or the information that the city of North Las Vegas sent. I'd like to go ahead and follow up at least and submit after this hearing through your staff the appeal packet and that was the response to them, as well as to the cities of Las Vegas and Henderson, uh, because that does address, address the issues that the uh, city of Las Vegas at least had raised as well. So. Um, and, and actually shows that the most accurate effort was made to be unbiased and provide a, a statistically accurate estimate. Um, and just walked you through the thinking process on that. Okay. Is that possible? Yes. I mean, I, I mean, it will offer a complete record. Um, it's, it's, you know, I, you, I know you got a chance to say something, but um, 
I think that would be fine. Just submit it. All right. So closing remarks, Director Young. I apologize for the delay, Melanie Young, Executive Director for the Nevada Department of Taxation. And, and I don't believe that um, with, first off, I wanna thank everybody for their time um, and attention to this uh, complicated matter for the department. And um, in, in closing, in answering um, your question, Senator Neal, is I would say that the census totals are not prohibited from being used because the de demographer uses some of that information when he arrives at his totals. So there are some alignment between that information um, and what he does. And so um, that concludes my closing remarks. And again, you know, we are here to um, be transparent through this process and are willing to work with um, others on this bill. So thank you. Okay, thank you for that. And so um, folks that were listening in, I would definitely direct you to reach out to uh, Director Young and her staff and Mr. Hardcastle to work out the other issues on the regression um, because that's tangential, but it's, it's uh, not the direct issue that they were dealing with in this bill. Madam Chair, you appear to be on mute. Oh. oh God, Zoom. All right, so we will close the hearing on SB 74 and we will open up for public comment. To take your place in the queue to make public comment, please press star nine now. Again, to take your place in the queue to make public comment, please press star nine now. Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers to make public comment at this time. Okay. So we will go ahead and adjourn Senate Revenue and Economic Development. Everybody have a good afternoon.